This is Kyle Welch with RCR Wireless News. I want to thank everyone for attending a practical in introduction to Volte testing in the field, presented by Rodian Schwarz. Our presenter today is Paul Denisowski, Application Engineer at Rodian Schwarz. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Paul. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for attending our webinar, A Practical Introduction to Volte Testing in the Field. My name is Paul Denisowski, and I'm an Applications Engineer at Rodian Schwartz, where I specialize in our coverage measurement and interference hunting solutions. Now, although there have been quite a number of webinars, white papers, and other resources available for learning about Volte, Voice over LTE, uh, the vast majority of Volte-related material to date has been focused primarily on research and development, design, lab-based device testing, terrestrial signaling, etc. And this, of course, made complete sense during the early stages of Volte. But as we now move towards actual field trials and rollout of Volte services, there's a need, in, in my opinion, for practical information about testing and troubleshooting Volte in the field. So the focus of this webinar is to provide the kind of practical information needed to test and troubleshoot Volte devices and the network in the real world, so to speak. We're going to start today's webinar with a brief discussion regarding the history of what would have been called telephony in the old days, old days here being anything before about the mid-1990s. This is important in understanding what end user expectations are with regards to voice services, especially when it comes to the question of voice quality. From there, we'll move on to a somewhat high-level overview of Volte. Again, the purpose of this webinar is not to provide an exhaustive description of Volte, since there are many excellent resources for that, but rather to provide a tutorial or a refresher, as the case may be, on the most important topics in terms of understanding how Volte calls are made, how to measure the important parameters of a Volte call, and how to troubleshoot any issues that might arise. One of the first steps in this will be understanding how Volte calls are established, the signaling. Following that, we'll move on to an overview of voice quality. Some people call it speech quality. I'm going to use the terms more or less interchangeably. Uh, since carrying human speech communication is, of course, the whole purpose of Volte. Before we get into the testing sections, we'll have a brief discussion of the differences between lab testing and field testing and how the tools and methodologies differ between these two areas. I'll then go into a discussion of the practical aspects of testing and troubleshooting, both on signaling and voice quality side. And I'll follow that up by taking some, uh, talking about some additional testing considerations, such as the need to test supplemental signaling, et cetera. And finally, we'll end with a brief summary and an open question and answer period. So let's dive right in with a discussion of the evolution of voice and wireline in networks. I'm using the term wireline as opposed to wireless, and prior to the late 1980s, pretty much all voice services were wireline services. Uh, those of you who work in telephony may remember the acronym POTS, Plain Old Telephone Service, which was essentially the ability to have a speech path between two subscribers. In the very, very early days, this was entirely analog end-to-end, -end, but by the 1960s, 1970s, the telephone networks began to carry voice in digital form as well. The connection from your home to the first switch or peripheral was analog, possibly still is, but from that point on it was digitized for transmission through the telephone network. This digitization was performed using a codec, a coder decoder, that converted the analog voice signal into digital bits, but to conserve bandwidth, the speech signal was filtered and non-uniformly sampled. Now, this system worked very well, provided acceptable voice quality, and was very, very reliable. However, it did suffer from some drawbacks. The speech channel was tied up even if no information was being sent, so it was inefficient. It was also difficult to take advantage of advances in codecs and speech coding that allowed acceptable voice quality even at lower bit rates. And last, but certainly not least, it was expensive, especially when it came to long distance and overseas calls. At this point, voice over IP, or VoIP, entered the picture. In fact, so-called toll bypass was the biggest initial motivator behind VoIP deployments, since it provided free voice calling over existing IP networks. More importantly, VoIP provided tremendous benefits in terms of flexibility and efficiency, and this has become the norm for many, if not most, landline calls. So why is any of this relative, relevant for Volte? Well, Volte leverages many of the technology used in VoIP. The signaling protocols used to set up, modify, and tear down calls the transport protocols used to carry the voice samples, etc. It wouldn't be completely inaccurate to call Volte voice over IP over LTE. Uh, many of the challenges in early Volte deployments are very similar to those seen in VoIP deployments, which means that we can leverage that knowledge, those methods, and those tools as well. Moving over to wireless, let's talk about voice service in pre-LTE cellular networks. The first cellular networks in the United States used AMPS. Uh, no one at the time called it 1G, of course to carry voice over analog channels using FM modulation. AMPS didn't natively provide data services, although some techniques like CDPD, cellular digital packet data, were developed for carrying data on unused voice channels. Now, voice began to be carried digitally beginning in 2G networks such as GSM. The GSM was a significant improvement over AMPS in that the lower bit rate codecs could be used to increase efficiency, and it was also much better at supporting data services. 
3G networks such as WCDMA and UMTS offered even better integration and handling of both voice and data services. But in both 2G and 3G networks, there was always a clear separation between so-called circuit switched or voice and packet switched or data domains, separate channels, different signaling, etc. Low or lower bitrate codecs were a very important development since bandwidth is far scarcer in resource and wireline than wire, uh, wireless and wireline networks. Reducing the bit rate, bit rate allowed more calls per hertz, so to speak, uh, but at the cost of lower voice quality. And lastly, the integration of voice signaling between the cellular and landline networks, the PSTN, the public switch telephone network, could be somewhat complex. So although we were moving in the right direction, there were things that could still be improved with regards to voice services and cellular networks. At this point, one might well ask, well, I have a phone that does LTE, and I've been using it to make voice calls for years. How is that possible if we're just now deploying Volte? It's an excellent question. Well, there are many reasons, some technical, some political. Uh, LTE was launched as a data-only service, and the fact remains that people wanted and needed voice service on their LTE phones. A uh, number of different approaches have been taken, but the most important of these for having voice and data simultaneously, or on the same phone at least, are SVLTE, simultaneous voice and LTE, and circuit switch fallback. Simultaneous voice and LTE is exactly what it sounds like. It's essentially two radios running in the same phone at the same time. One is used for LTE data services, and the other is used for carrying voice over 2G or 3G networks. Uh, the advantage is, as the name implies, that you can have simultaneous voice and data. But it's a somewhat inelegant and inefficient approach. Two radios also means much higher current consumption, that is, a shorter battery life. Uh, there's also an issue with non-identical coverage. Now, circuit switch fallback, which nobody calls CSFB for some reason, also works pretty much this, as the name implies. When you need to make a voice call, the phone drops back down to 3G or possibly even 2G for the duration of the call, and then is supposed, at least, to go back to LTE when you're done. Unlike SVLTE, this typically means no simultaneous voice or data, and the transition back to LTE doesn't always go very smoothly, if at all. And while many of us can personally attest to the fact that these approaches do provide voice service on LTE devices, they're something of a kludge designed to bridge the gap between the initial rollout of LTE data service and the introduction of Volte. So what is Volte? Well, one important way that LTE differs from 2G, 3G technologies, at least in a historical sense, is that it was deployed backwards. In 2G, voice came before data. In 3G, voice and data came at the same time. And in 4G, LTE, data came first, with voice following only years later. So again, what is Volte? Well, Volte allows voice calls or speech communication to be carried natively over LTE data connections. Aside from the technical shortcomings of things like SVLTE or circuit switch fallback, one important reason why network operators would like to roll out Volte is that it would facilitate the decommissioning of older generations, such as 2G, that are kept around mostly to support voice services. The first commercial launch of Volte service took place in Korea in 2012, and there are initial deployments, or at least lots of ads about deployments, across the United States today. And if we believe the marketing, commercial Volte service is likely to be commonplace by 2015. One acronym that's often seen in conjunction with Volte, or LTE in general, is IMS, the IP Multimedia Subsystem. IMS is one of the enabling technologies for Volte. It was originally supposed to be rolled out at the same time as LTE, but it was late. And this is one of the reasons why interim solutions such as SVLTE and circuit switch fallback were developed. Uh, IMS is a very, very large topic and really merits a webinar of its own, or perhaps two. But there are a couple of things that are helpful to know with regards to Volte, and we'll touch on some of these further on in the webinar. Speaking of interoperability, the GSMA has defined a special profile for voice and SMS, it's IR92, to promote interoperability between different vendors' LTE implementations. One of my favorite sayings is that the nice thing about standards is there are so many to choose from. And IR92 is an attempt to avoid some of the same interoperability issues that plague the early voice over IP deployments. You may also come across the term one voice for describing LTE. One voice was the GSMA term used for the initial feature requirements of Volte, but it's not really used much anymore. Well, how do we actually make a Volte call? Let's take a 10,000 foot view of the steps that are involved. In the interest of time and brevity, we're going to ignore some of the underlying protocols and signaling used in non-Volte situations and focus on those things that are more Volte specific and which can provide useful testing and troubleshooting information in the field. If your device won't ratch properly, getting a Volte call to work is really the least of your concerns. Uh, the first thing that a Volte UE needs to do, it has to obtain a PCSCF, or Proxy Call State Control Function address. Since all SIP signaling travels through the PCSCF, a failure to get this address is pretty much a showstopper when it comes to making a Volte call. 
in order to carry data of any kind, voice or otherwise, through the LTE network, a bearer has to be established. Although the process for establishing a bearer is essentially the same as for LTE data services, failing to establish a bearer will also keep the Volte call from working. Registering with IMS is also required for obtaining Volte services, especially if you want people to be able to call you. And as you may have guessed, failure to successfully register with IMS will also prevent Volte calls from being established. Now, SIP, the session initiation protocol, is used for the call control signaling in Volte networks, and we'll be looking in depth at SIP messaging a little bit later in this webinar. In a nutshell, SIP invite messages containing capability information, codec type supported, etc., uh, those are sent and then hopefully received and acknowledged by the call led party. Media information, in this case digitized speech samples, are then exchanged between the calling and call led parties, and the call is ultimately released using a SIP by message. Again, we'll cover all of these in a little more detail in a few more slides. One last point, in some cases the UE has to be explicitly configured to use Volte, as in the example screenshot here. As I mentioned before, wouldn't it be wholly inaccurate to describe Volte as voice over IP over LTE? Uh, this is, of course, a significant oversimplification in many areas, but when it comes to the IP layer protocols used in Volte, there's really very little difference between voice over LTE and voice over IP. There are three main IP protocols used in Volte, SIP, SDP, and RTP. RTCP is also used in some cases, although its use varies somewhat between implementations. Uh, we'll discuss each of these in some detail in subsequent slides, but let's start with a quick overview. SIP is the session initiation protocol and is used for registration, notification, and call setup and teardown. SDP, the session description protocol, is actually carried inside of the SIP message and contains information regarding parameters such as codec types, bandwidth, etc. SIP and SDP are text-based protocols, very similar to HTTP, which means that they are in a humanly readable format. And as we'll see in the subsequent slides, this is very, very helpful in troubleshooting. RTP, the real-time protocol, is used to convey the actual voice data, that is, the digitized speech samples, and this is obviously a critical component for Volte. The use of RTCP, the real-time control protocol, not pictured actually on the slide, is somewhat optional. In some implementations, RTCP is used as a keep alive when no speech activity is present. Again, we'll discuss all of these in more detail shortly. Being real-time in nature, RTP is always carried over UDP. Now, although not shown explicitly on the slide, another important thing to note is that unlike most wireline networks, the IP in Volte is usually IP version 6, not the IP version 4 that most of you are familiar with. Volte also makes use of a number of IP layer enhancements not shown on the slide, such as robust header compression, which helps reduce packet overhead, and IPsec for security. Normally, however, we'll not look any lower than SIP or SDP or RTP when actually testing and troubleshooting Volte networks. As mentioned previously, Volte signaling uses both SIP, the session initiation protocol, and SDP, the session description protocol. Uh, these are IP protocols defined by the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, and they've been around for a very, very long time. They are not Volte specific. In addition to being used for commercial voice over IP products, they're also used in well-known applications like FaceTime and Skype. SIP is by far the dominant packet voice signaling protocol, both in the wireline and the wireless worlds. What this means from a practical point of view is there's a very large body of knowledge related to these protocols, and these protocols are fairly mature. Uh, SIP was being used when 3G was still in its infancy. On this slide, we see the header of a SIP invite message. Notice again that it's in plain text, humanly readable, and it's being used to begin a voice call, and we can see the calling and call-ed parties as well as some additional information. So how are SIP messages actually used to set up and tear down calls in Volte? Uh, let's take a look at some SIP signaling message flows. The signaling used in SIP is not unlike the messages exchanged for establishing voice calls in traditional 2G and 3G networks. An invite message is sent containing information about the calling and call-ed parties. When this message is received at the call-ed side, a trying and then a ringing message are returned. This gives the calling party some indication that the call is actually underway. Once the call-ed party answers, an OK message is sent, followed by an acknowledgement from the calling party. At this point, the speech calls established and media, voice samples inside of RTP packets, can be exchanged between the two parties. We have a call. The call is ended by sending a by message, which is then acknowledged as well. All of this is fairly straightforward and not unlike the types of call flows seen in other call setup protocol exchanges. In the decoded messages, uh, signaling messages here on the right of the slide, we also see a special type of acknowledgement message, namely the PRAC or provisional response acknowledgement. This is a special type of acknowledgement response that is sent to acknowledge receipt of certain classes of message to indicate that they're being acted on. For example, in, the, in this case, after the invite was sent, the called party responds with trying and then ringing. Uh, once the calling party receives the ringing message, it knows to play ring back to the caller. 
but what if these messages, which are sent unreliably, are lost? Well, the PRAC response, uh, request response mechanism is a way to acknowledge that the recipient is actually acting on the messages. The other important part of the Volte signaling exchange is the use of SDP, or the session description protocol. SDP is not sent as separate messages, but as part of the SIP invite message, the message that is used to set up the call itself. In addition to including addressing information, such as SIP address, telephone number, IP address, etc., SDB plays the important role of indicating to the other side what types of capabilities it supports. For example, the phone may only support certain codecs, certain bit rates, etc., and this information must be communicated to the other party so that a mutually compatible set of parameters can be chosen. In the traditional PSDN, the telephone network, this would be a silly concept, right? After all, any landline phone can call and communicate with every other landline phone in the world with no explicit negotiation required. But in the case of Volte and other IP-based networks, there's no guarantee that both sides will even support the same technologies, and therefore, these capabilities must be explicitly signaled and negotiated. With regards to testing and troubleshooting Volte in the field, this is important for a number of reasons. The inability of certain Volte phones to successfully call certain other phones or other devices even may in fact be due to an inability to negotiate a common set of parameters. Similarly, if a user cannot take advantage of certain advanced features, such as so-called HD voice, which we'll discuss shortly, this is almost certainly due to a lack of support on one or both ends, something that can be easily read from the humanly readable SDP messages. SDP also allows for renegotiation of parameters during a session or call. Sudden changes in voice quality due to changes in codec type, bandwidth, etc., may be caused by renegotiation on the part of either side of the call. And the only definitive way to detect and diagnose this is to examine the SDP messages. Now that we've covered signaling, I'd like to move over to the transport side and talk about RTP, the real-time protocol. RTP is another protocol that was first applied for voice over IP deployments, and since then has been used in many, many other areas as well. For Volte, RTP is used to carry the digitized voice samples between endpoints. As the name implies, RTP is designed to carry real-time data, that is, data which must be delivered in a timely fashion, and for which there's usually no possibility of retransmission or error recovery. In other words, there's no time to ask the sender to retransmit lost packets. Errored packets are simply discarded, and even out-of-order packets may be discarded, rather than trying to buffer them and reinsert them at the correct point. Uh, for this reason, UDP rather than TCP is used as a transport protocol, since the reliable transport provided by TCP doesn't really provide any benefit here. Although the contents of an individual RTP packet, that is the digitized voice samples, is not terribly useful by itself for testing or troubleshooting, RTP packets do contain certain information that is extremely important in the evaluation of Volte networks. Each RTP packet is given a sequence number and a timestamp. In the screenshot here on the right of the slide, you can see the incrementing sequence number and timestamp. Sequence numbers provide an easy way to detect lost and out-of-order packets, and obviously these are both things we'd like to minimize in our real-time, no retransmission Volte network. The timestamps provide another valuable piece of information, namely how much jitter is being introduced as the RTP packets travel from sender to receiver. If two RTP packets were sent, say, 10 milliseconds apart and received 10.1 or 9.9 .9 milliseconds apart, then 0.1 milliseconds of jitter was introduced. Jitter is an inevitable characteristics of, a characteristic of packet-based networks. It's usually introduced due to switching and routing devices, among other things. But as we'll see, excessive levels of jitter can cause serious problems at Volte networks, and it's often correlated with poor voice quality. Speaking of which, what is voice quality? Before we get into our discussion of the effects of jitter and packet loss on voice quality, we really need to define first what we mean by voice quality. Voice quality, and again, some people also refer to it as speech quality, is a subjective measurement of how closely received audio signals correspond to the originally sent audio signal. Actually, I should be a little bit more precise here. We're not talking about audio signals so much as human speech. The original digitization in wireline telephone networks was optimized for human voice. Even though humans can hear sounds up to about 20 kilohertz, depending in part on your age and to a certain extent on your lifestyle, the uh, original codecs used in telephony filtered the speech at about 4 kilohertz, since this lower frequency range contains most of the important information about human speech. For example, despite filtering out the upper three quarters of the original signal, we can easily not only understand other people on the phone, but normally we can recognize their voices and even subtle nuances such as their moods, etc. This audio filtering and uh, lower bitrate encoding saved bandwidth, but of course at the cost of quality. In 2G and 3G networks, even lower bitrate codecs could be used to save bandwidth. Subscribers are usually, usually willing to trade voice quality for the convenience of mobility, but it's pretty safe to say that in order for Volte to be successful, the voice quality must be at least as good as in the traditional cellular networks, 
And as we'll see in a few slides, Volte in fact provides the means to improve voice quality to levels that exceed those in landline networks. But let's get back for a moment again to how we evaluate voice quality. In the old days, the way that voice quality was evaluated was, frankly, to have a lot of different people listen to it and then rank the quality in a scale of one to five, where one was the worst and five was the best. This is therefore called the mean, because it's an average, opinion, because it's a bunch of people's opinions, score. Uh, incidentally, the expression MOS score is somewhat redundant, Mo mean opinion score score. But it's fairly common, and if you listen carefully, I'm likely to call it MOS score at least once during this presentation. There are a couple of things that should be kept in mind regarding MOS testing. Somewhat arbitrarily, a MOS of four has traditionally been considered toll quality. That is what one would expect to hear on a landline call, phone call, free from noise, static, or other forms of interference. In 2G and 3G cellular networks, a MOS of about 3.5, give or take, would be considered good quality. And again, this is somewhat unavoidable due to the use of lower bitrate codecs and a slightly unreliable transport mechanism, namely the radio link. Ironically, in some cases, the audio quality in the analog 1G AMPS networks was superior to that in 2G and 3G networks, since the audio was carried as pure FM analog signals. Now, MOS testing is the gold standard when it comes to voice quality, since ultimately what matters is the opinion of human listeners. Unfortunately, the traditional method of testing voice quality using MOS is completely impractical in dynamic networks like Volte. In order to run a pro proper MOS test, you need a group of untrained listeners. That is, people who are not trained, either explicitly or from experience, to recognize certain impairments in audio signals. Anyone who's worked in voice quality testing knows that after a while, you get very good at picking up subtle imperfections that would most likely be unnoticed by 99% of the general population. In any event, testing voice quality with human listeners is essentially impractical when it comes to field or even lab testing and troubleshooting. Note also that traditional MOS testing is single-ended. We listen to a speech sample and compare it to what we think the original signal should have sounded like. It's not really a true comparison of the original and the received signal. We'll come back to this distinction again in a few slides. So how do we evaluate speech quality where we can't take a busload of human listeners around with us? Well, there have been numerous attempts to develop mathematical algorithms to evaluate speech quality. Whether these algorithms work or how good they are is simply a function of how closely they correlate with the scores obtained through proper MOS testing. The fact that this is an, ob an objective measurement is really meaningless if it doesn't correlate very strongly with the subjective evaluation of human beings. Unlike humans, uh, speech quality algorithms don't have an inherent notion of what a speech sample should sound like. So instead of comparing the received signal to some theoretical reference, as we humans do in our heads, uh, they use both the original and received, presumably degraded, speech sample as their inputs, and then calculate a MOS equivalent based on these samples. And one very important thing to keep in mind is that this comparison is much more than a simple diff, so to speak, of the sent and received signals. There's an entire field of science called psychoacoustics that studies how our brains and ears interpret sounds. From psychoacoustic research, we know that not all impairments are seen as equally important by our ears and our brains. And as we'll see on the next slide, this is important in the development of, of speech quality algorithms. Interest in developing an objective speech quality algorithm that could produce a reliable MOS equivalent really coincided with the early development of voice over IP networks. As I mentioned before, much of the technology and methodologies used in VoIP are applicable in Volte networks as well. Beginning around 1996, the ITUT came up with uh, three different voice quality algorithms, one after the other, PSQM, then PESC, and most recently Polka. Each new version was designed to overcome shortcomings in the previous version, such as issues caused by variable delay when using PSQM. And in the case of Volte and higher bitrate codecs, Polka is really the only suitable ITUT voice quality algorithm. These algorithms correlate very strongly with MOS and are therefore a good predictor of humanly perceived speech quality. Note also that there are proprietary voice quality algorithms, such as Squad, and these often provide additional information related to speech quality, such as delay, noise, etc. Although we tend to think of voice quality as simply a function of how something sounds, things such as excessive delay, echo, etc., also influence our subjective evaluation of speech quality, even though we do not, they don't really directly relate to the clarity of the received audio. Uh, for example, a connection with very high delay causes talk over or double talk, people interrupting each other. And at very high levels, this can cause the conversation to become half duplex. High levels of delay also make it difficult to compensate for echo, another factor that decreases the perceived quality of a speech conversation. As we mentioned before, RTP, the real-time protocol, which is used to carry the speech samples between sender and receiver, 
is, as the name implies, real time, and therefore lost packets are not recoverable. Losing RTB packets means we're losing speech information, which obviously can have a negative impact on voice quality. We also already touched on the concept of jitter, which is the change in the original spacing between the packets. In order to smoothly reproduce the received audio, we need to receive the speech samples at approximately the same intervals that they were sent. In order to restore the original spacing between the packets, the receiver has a so-called jitter buffer, where RTP packets are stored to remove or reduce jitter. However, since jitter buffers are finite in length, an excessive amount of jitter can cause the buffer to fill, at which point any incoming packets are simply discarded. So even if the packets containing the speech samples are not lost in transit, a real possibility, they may still be discarded on the receiving end due to excessive jitter. Well, what do we do when we've lost a packet? Playing nothing, that is dead air, is, is a bad idea, and it's very noticeable to the listener. Therefore, some form of error concealment must be used to hide packet loss, or at least make it less noticeable. Error concealment is very implementation specific. For example, one could replay the last correctly received packet, play white noise or pink noise that approximates the background noise of the sender, etc. In situations where there are very high levels of jitter or packet loss, the method used for error concealment can mean the difference between acceptable and unacceptable voice quality. But no matter what method, if any, of error concealment is used, the strongest predictor of voice quality in dual TE networks is usually the levels of jitter and packet loss. Fortunately, as we saw earlier, the header information of RTP packets allows an easy calculation of the jitter and packet loss as seen by the receiving device. And testing for correlation of these measurements with voice quality is an important first step in analyzing any voice quality issues. We've talked about codecs and how they save bandwidth by reducing the amount or the type of speech information sent. Psychoacoustics helps us better understand what sound differences are perceivable by both our ears and our brains. For example, the basilar membrane in our ears acts as a type of filter bank, and this masks low-level signals that are close to in frequency to high-level signals. Most of the codecs used in traditional 2G and 3G networks were developed using the help of psychoacoustic models. And some of these codecs, the AMR family, are also used in LTE to facilitate interoperability. Let's consider the bandwidth quality trade-off again. If bandwidth were not an issue, one could simply sample linearly at a little over 44 kilohertz, like an audio CD, and send a perfect reproduction of the original sound. Not practical, but certainly possible. Because LTE provides much higher data bandwidth than 2G or 3G networks, there's less need to select very low bitrate codecs. By using higher bitrate or wider codecs, we can actually send voice that's not only better than that in 2G or 3G networks, but is in fact superior to that found in wireline networks. This is so-called HD voice, high-definition voice, and is also one of the biggest drivers of Volte. Improved voice quality not only makes subscribers happier, but may also encourage holdouts to migrate from their old flip phone to something that actually provides better quality voice. Of course, in order for HD voice to work, it must be supported by both ends of the conversation. And this is where SDP, the session description protocol, comes into play again. If we look inside of the SDP message, I have a little sample shown on this slide, we can see support for the AMR wideband codec running at 16K meaning that this device is capable of supporting HD voice. If a subscriber complains about not getting HD voice quality, codec negotiation would be the very first thing to check. Now that we've gone over the protocols and methods used in Volte signaling, as well as the different aspects of voice quality testing, let's move on to the issues surrounding testing and troubleshooting Volte in the field. By field testing, I mean the use of commercially available devices running on live infrastructure. In other words, real UEs talking to real eNode Bs. This differs from lab-based testing in many ways. First and foremost, the RF environment in the field is, of course, much, much less controlled than lab testing. We have to deal with varying signal levels, path loss, external interference, multiple base stations, etc. And all of these may have a non-trivial impact on our Volte services. And although many people tend to think of lab testing as being functional testing and field testing being performance testing, this is a bit of an oversimplification, as we'll see on the next slide. Volte testing also requires both passive testing and active testing. This is the difference between making calls, active testing, and simply measuring the RF environment and base station signals, passive testing. Again, this is something we'll look at in a little more detail shortly. As you might expect, there are two main areas of Volte testing, testing the Volte signaling and testing the voice quality of Volte calls. Let's talk for a moment about the difference between functional and performance testing. As the name implies, we assume a certain basic functionality when it comes to functional testing. If the phone doesn't work at all, it probably won't, well, at least it shouldn't, make its way into field testing and troubleshooting. Basic functionality that we expect from a phone starts with the most fundamental of all requirements. Can it make a call at all? Uh, although this may seem like a very simple requirement, as most of you know, there's a, an awful lot that goes on in the background in terms of cell search, registration, messaging, etc. 
but these are fairly well understood and are not really Volte specific. Handovers or fallback in the case of LTE are somewhat more complex, especially since audio quality can be noticeably impacted during these operations. And drop voice calls are a lot more obvious to the subscriber than a brief interruption, say, in their email download. Certain voice-related features, such as supplemental services, ringback, etc., are also important for Volte. But again, these are mostly functions that are tested in a lab. So assuming the, the device passes a brief sanity check, we would normally move on to performance testing. Now, performance testing can, and in many cases, should be done in a lab environment. Key performance indicators, such as call setup time, voice quality, given a certain combination of bandwidth, codec, et cetera, these can all be easily tested in a lab environment. And this has the advantage of allowing us to test in a controlled environment. Usually, the device is actually connected to the tester via cable, not over the air. That said, there are limits to what can be done in this kind of environment. As we know from other types of testing as well, both signaling and voice quality performance in Volte are significantly influenced by external factors and therefore must be tested in the field. The biggest variable here is, of course, the RF environment, which is never as clean as or reliable as, the, uh, as you find in a lab. Another important consideration is loading. How does the UE and the supporting infrastructure, the enode bees, et cetera, behave when the system becomes more loaded? Loading can translate into things such as longer call setup times, increased failure rates, poorer performance, et cetera. And again, we'll look at some examples of this in a few more slides. In addition to the functional versus performance aspect of testing, there's also another distinction that's made when it comes to drive tests or generically coverage measurements. And that's what I'm going to refer to as passive versus active testing. Let me start by defining what I mean by this. In passive testing, we normally use a scanner, a device that receives and makes measurements on base station signals and possibly on the RF environment in general. Usually these are high performance instruments that can measure multiple base stations in multiple bands or multiple frequency ranges and even multiple technologies all at the same time. Scanners uh, provide useful coverage information, but since they're passive devices, they can't be used to measure most Volte specific signaling KPIs, such as call setup time, they also can't be used to measure voice quality since this would obviously require you to make a call. On the other hand, active testing requires the use of actual phones or UEs to make voice or data calls. Uh, since in this case we're dealing with active devices, we can measure both signaling and voice quality parameters of Volte calls. Using actual consumer devices, often loaded with special applications or firmware, means that comparisons can be made between different manufacturers' devices or even between different releases of the same device. Note that just like real devices, test devices only work on a single band at a time, although many can be fo forced to work on certain bands or technologies as needed. Now, as you may imagine, Volte requires active testing, although in many cases it's also highly advantageous to test both active and passively, in other words, using both scanners and UEs. It should also be noted that being able to perform testing of multiple active devices at the same time can provide very useful and sometimes very interesting data for comparing the Volte performance when using different bands, different providers, or different devices. Now, although this webinar is focused on LTE-specific testing and troubleshooting rather than on testing in general, it's important to keep in mind that both solid RF performance and solid IP layer performance are absolutely necessary for a successful Volte implementation. If you have poor coverage, low throughput, etc., this is pretty much a recipe for failure when it comes time to deliver Volte services. Remember that Volte is a real-time application in which even untrained users can easily detect performance issues. It's a lot easier to notice bad voice quality than an excessive number of, say, TCP retransmissions when you're retrieving your email. This means that a thorough evaluation of your existing LTE network should be done before rolling out Volte, and any deficiencies or shortcomings in both the RF or IP environments should be rectified in order to provide a solid foundation for Volte. Uh, in the screenshot here, we see a UE that's getting very low throughput, most likely due to a very high blur block error rate and or the use of QPSK, the lowest order of the LTE downlink modulation schemes. This could be due to many factors, such as poor coverage or external interference, but in any event, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to provide acceptable Volte service given these performance levels. A good rule of thumb is that whenever you encounter either signaling or voice quality issues, check the lower layers first. The most important KPIs used in Volte signaling are not significantly different from those used in traditional 2 or 3G networks. From an end user point of view, the most noticeable and hence the most important of these KPIs is usually call setup time, call success rate, drop calls, and ringback. Call setup time is simply the time between the end of dialing or digit collection and ringback. The expectation here is usually on the order of several seconds. Call success rate, that is the percentage of calls that actually go through, should of course always be 100%. 
and a success rate of anything less than the upper 90% range is usually viewed as un unfavorably by subscribers. Similarly, the percentage of drop calls should ideally be zero, and anything more than an extremely low percentage of drop calls is considered unacceptable by subscribers. Ringback is an interesting issue, especially in Bolte. A successful phone call is not necessarily one in which the other party or their voicemail answers. A successful call is one in which we hear ringback within an acceptable period of time. As we'll see in a couple of slides, the SIP signaling used in Volte has both a trying and a ringback message. And in some implementations, the ringback message is not correctly sent or processed. In other words, the call is proceeding, but the user is unaware of this, and after a few seconds, the call is abandoned and reinitiated. If this happens to many users simultaneously, it can lead to a type of signaling storm in which the network is swamped with aborted call attempts. There are some other ways that signaling can fail. Obviously, a lack of packet connectivity is a pretty severe problem for a packet-based voice system. Failure to register with IMS is also a common issue in early Volte deployments, although thankfully this is uh, usually a simple configuration issue. A total failure of IMS would be catastrophic, and therefore that part of the infrastructure is normally designed to be very robust. And despite the best efforts of vendors and standards bodies to avoid them, some compatibility mismatches still do occur, most frequently between Volte and non-Volte devices. Looking at, looking at SIP messaging is therefore a very important first step in troubleshooting any signaling related issues. Let's look at an example of this. This is a screenshot from a mobile device running both a Volte client as well as a coverage measurement application that provides real-time visibility into the signaling messages. Note, uh, for the purposes of clarity, I've turned, off, I've turned on filtering to exclude all non-SIP messages like RRC layer messages, etc. Here we see the device attempting to register on the network and the failure of that registration with an unauthorized response. Those of you familiar with HTML might notice that there's a strong similarity between the SIP and HTTP in terms of their request response messages and classes. We can also see that the unauthorized response was returned very quickly, about 300 milliseconds, I think. So the next step would be to check the configuration of our Volte device. Correct versions, a valid and active SIM, proper provisioning in the core network, etc. Had the Volte device submitted a request which was never responded to, not a timeout, this would of course indicate a different type of issue, such as a lack of IP layer reachability, temporary unavailability of the IMS server, etc. As I mentioned before, if subscribers don't hear ring back after a certain period of time, they will usually assume that the call attempt was unsuccessful and will try to renegotiate, or sorry, try to re-originate the call, that is hang up and try dialing the number again. Aside from the obvious customer satisfaction issues this creates, it can also have a significant effect on the performance of the network if this lack of or delayed ring back begins to affect large numbers of subscribers within a certain geographical area. Here we see another SIP message exchange in which the initial call setup request, the invite message, is answered by the far end using a response trying message. This response came back almost immediately, uh, about 200 milliseconds after the initial invite message was sent. It's pretty good performance. However, the ring back message took about five and a half seconds. And during this time, the calling party had no indication that the call was actually already proceeding. Whether this is an acceptable delay or not is certainly debatable, but in any case, it would be worth investigating the cause. In some cases, the delays encountered in ringback may be due to factors outside of the control of the network operator. And having this type of signaling information can be helpful in addressing uh, customer complaints regarding excessive call setup times. Now, subscribers may or may not be good subjective judges of excessive call setup times, et cetera, but almost every human being who's ever used a telephone is a very good judge of what constitutes good voice quality. Voice quality is by far the most important metric when it comes to Volte but it can also be the hardest to quantify, and determining the factors that contribute to, or detract from, voice quality is a non-trivial task in many cases. As I've mentioned several times before in this presentation, a clean RF environment and solid IP layer performance is absolutely essential for, for providing acceptable voice quality in Volte networks. Jitter and packet loss, the strongest predictors of voice quality, are heavily influenced by the quality of the RF and IP layer, and the converse is also true. Jitter and packet loss are usually excellent indicators of problems at the lower layers. If we were to assume a perfect RF and IP environment, we would still have variation in voice quality, primarily due to variation in the types of codecs and the packet rates used. Earlier, we alluded to so-called HD, or high-definition voice, as being a way to provide higher quality audio compared to traditional wireline or cellular networks. But of course, this requires that both endpoints support the associated codecs and rates, and that the transport network can provide good quality of service between those endpoints uh, to avoid problems with jitter and packet loss. Here again, the text-based, humanly readable nature of SIP, and in particular SCP, are extremely helpful in diagnosing lower than expected voice quality. 
Error concealment and other implementation issues also play a role in the level of perceived voice quality. Keep in mind that such things as echo and delay also figure into our perception of the quality of a speech conversation, even though neither of these has a direct impact on the clarity or fidelity of the received audio per se. Although the ITUT voice quality algorithms like Polka only assess voice quality in the strictest sense, proprietary algorithms and methods like Squad, for instance, provide additional information on things such as delay. And lastly, remember that despite all of our advances in perceptual speech quality algorithms, etc., uh, that provide good correlation with MOS, the most important metric is the subjective evaluation made by human beings. All of us have a very reliable built-in speech quality evaluation system, namely our ears and our brain, and the value of this tool should really should not be underrated. Although we would like a repeatable, maybe somewhat deterministic way of determining voice quality during performance or coverage testing, simply listening to the audio samples with your own ears can be very, very helpful in troubleshooting specific voice quality issues. For example, I may have a very poor MOS or voice quality score because of an overall sustained degradation of the received audio. Or I may have excellent vo quality voice for much of my conversation with very short instances of complete in unintelligibility. Even though I may get similar MOS scores for both scores, average scores, the types of artifacts and impairments are quite different and they point to very different causes for poor speech quality. Now, there is no magic metric that can be used to predict voice quality since, as we've seen, it's a function of many different variables. That said, I'd like to stress once again that the importance of jitter and packet loss as predictors or estimators of voice quality. If I could only choose two variables to track doing LT field testing, those two variables would be jitter, packet loss, and MOS. Actually, that might be three variables. But in any case, in field trials of both wireline and wireless networks using packet voice, the jitter and packet loss observed in the RTP streams has always had the best correlation with voice quality. It's not to say there's a linear correlation. An X percent increase in packet loss or jitter doesn't lead to a Y percent degradation of voice quality. In, in fact, the, usually the relationship is very nonlinear with a pronounced cliff effect. In other words, voice quality may degrade somewhat gracefully as the levels of jitter and packet loss increase and then become significantly worse, fall off the cliff, so to speak, after reaching a certain threshold value. This threshold value is usually a function of things such as codec type, jitter buffer length, error concealment, and therefore will be different for different implementations. Does this mean that there's no value in attempting to come up with a formula or a model to predict voice quality based on IP layer metric? Not at all. The important thing to keep in mind is that this model or algorithm needs to be refined and developed through experimentation. In other words, through field testing. The value in any model is in its ability to predict and therefore it would be very useful to know that certain levels of jitter packet loss are moving us very close to the cliff and give us a chance to take appropriate proactive action before voice quality degrades to unacceptable levels. In pre-LTE networks, dedicated packet switched and circuit switched channels meant that there was very little chance that voice data and voice and traffic data rather would interfere with each other, assuming of course that your network supported simultaneous voice and data. Uh, as we've seen, everything in LTE is carried as data on the same channel. So there's a very real risk that Volte traffic, more specifically the RTP packets carrying the voice data, could be affected by the presence of other non-Volte data traffic, such as web browsing, email downloading, mapping, etc. This could take the form of reduced throughput, packet loss, packet jitter, etc. And all of these can have a measurable and significant impact on the quality and reliability of our Volte-based speech connection. Therefore, it's very important that the network somehow be able to control and or prioritize data traffic in order to ensure that Volte data is not being adversely affected by non-Volte data. Another way of saying this is we prefer a situation in which Volte traffic is prioritized over other IP traffic or is guaranteed a certain minimum level of bandwidth to ensure acceptable voice quality. One simple way of doing this in the cellular world is to have multiple bearers with different quality of service parameters. Another way is to identify the data flows that are carrying RTP traffic and prioritize these packets. And of course, there's always the tried and true method of simply throwing more bandwidth at the issue, usually a bigger pipe, so to speak. No matter what mechanism is used, it's important to test voice quality and voice signaling in the presence of simultaneous data streams. Does my voice quality stay stable when I re start receiving large email attachments? Do simultaneous streaming applications have a greater or lesser impact on non-real-time bulk data transfer applications? This can be done using real applications, real such as starting a large FTP download or accessing a lot of websites simultaneously, or it can be done with load generation or packet blasting tools and applications such as iPerf 
Ideally, we'd like to test using both types of traffic, packet blasting like iPerf because it's repeatable, and genuine user traffic, well, because it's genuine and what people will tend to see in the field. We've talked a lot about Volte performance, both in terms of signaling as well as voice quality, and we've gone into some detail about the factors that impact Volte performance, the RF environment, signaling behavior, packet loss, et cetera. We've also said there's no magic formula for computing voice quality, although some factors are stronger predictors than others. However, you may have noticed that I'm trying to avoid putting a firm number on what is an acceptable level of performance in a Volte network. Why? Well, the main reason is that there's also no magic formula for determining the level of quality that the subscriber will find acceptable. Customers used to an eight second call setup time would be delighted with a four second call setup time. Customers used to codecs that make the speaker sound like he or she has marbles in their mouth would be very impressed by landline quality voice, to say nothing of HD voice. But even if we have some target average value that we're trying to meet in our Volte network in terms of voice quality, and we meet that value, the consistency of quality is also important to consider. Think about this for a moment. How much variation is there in the call setup time and voice quality of a wireline phone call, a traditional POX call? Very, very little. In fact, this is why MOS testing with rooms full of humans was practical in landline networks. The quality did not change that much from call to call. In cellular and voice over IP based networks, we have much more variation in the quality of the calls due to all the different parameters that go into each call. And this is one of the reasons for the development of speech quality algorithms such as Polka. You know, although it's been said that variety is the spice of life, people generally don't like a lot of variety when it comes to the quality of their phone calls. Subscribers tend to prefer a consistently mediocre quality over quality that ping pongs between really great and really poor, even if both produce the same average value. In a screenshot shown here, we see an example of very consistent MOS between calls. All of the speech conversations have you know, roughly the same MOS equivalents. If we now look at some other test results, we'll see that there's significant, that is serious, variation here in quality. For starters, about a quarter of the calls were dropped, and the MOS varied between four, very good, to 1.74, which is essentially unusable. Even the most patient subscriber would, in the first month of a two-year contract would probably consider switching providers if this were the type of Volte service they received. A consistent loss of three would, would be on the low end of acceptable, but would probably not prompt subscribers to abandon ship the way this kind of performance would. The point here is that given the large number of variables that influence the quality of Volte calls, we have to be much more mindful of the distribution of measured values rather than simply the average value measured over some period of time. Since we're still in the very early phases of rolling out Volte, at least here in the United States, the main focus for field testing and troubleshooting of Volte is, by necessity, standard Volte functionality. Can I make a call? How long does it take to set up a call? Does the call stay up even during handovers? What's voice quality like, et cetera? There are, however, other aspects of voice calls that also need to be tested, although in many cases, these will likely be second priority during initial deployments. For example, the ability to make emergency 911 calls is a regulatory requirement, but there are several ways in which calling 911 is different from calling ordinary subscribers. As you might imagine, there are some issues with testing emergency calls in the field using a real 911 system. So this is an area where traditionally testing has been done with a base station simulator and a shield room. Nevertheless, some level of field testing should be performed, preferably in coordination with your local public safety department, in order to ensure that emergency calls also work in a real life environment. Supplementary, simple, supplementary services like call forwarding, call waiting, etc., are very popular, and SIP supports a wide range of such services. However, some initial implementations of SIP are focused on providing basic functionality and may not yet include support or at least solid support for certain supplemental services, so these should be tested in the field as well. As much as many of you attending this webinar might prefer that every phone call in the world was always a mobile to mobile call, we also have to keep in mind that in many cases, Volte users will be calling people who are not on a Volte network. A call from someone using a Volte phone to someone using Skype may have terrible voice quality, but that has nothing to do with a cellular network or Volte implementation in most cases. I mentioned before that we take for granted that every landline phone in the world can call every other landline phone in the world due to the extremely uniform nature of telephony. Volte devices will need to be, communicate, be able to communicate with a very diverse set of other devices. Test calls should be made not only to other Volte phones, but to traditional 2G and 3G phones, landlines, IP phones, applications, etc. When subscribers raise issues regarding incompatibility or poor voice quality, it's helpful to have already tested, or at least be able to test, these types of scenarios as well. Note also that in many cellular network operators have their own test plans for Volte deployment. So we have to measure the Volte uh, supplemental services using instruments and devices that support these proprietary tests. And lastly, there have been a number of concerns recently regarding the power consumption of Volte devices. 
namely that being on a Volte call causes, or at least is purported to cause, a significant increase in power consumption, which translates into shorter battery life, uh, another reason that, uh, another subject rather that subscribers tend to be very sensitive to. Since battery life is also a function of many different things in the field, distance from the E node B, et cetera, it's important to perform field testing to determine to what extent this variation in battery life is dependent on Volte versus non-Volte factors. So I'd like to conclude by going over some of the main points from the webinar today. First, we provided an overview of what Volte is and in what ways it's similar to and different from other voice networks. We then provided a brief description of the main IP layer protocols used in Volte and how analysis of these messages could provide valuable information. With regards to signaling, certain KPIs such as call setup time are important to test and measure. Voice quality being the deliverable, so to speak, in Volte networks, we spent a fair amount of time talking about what voice quality is, how to measure it, and the factors that impact it, the most important of which being jitter and packet loss. Moving further down the stack, we looked at the importance of good RF performance and the impact it can have on the upper layers. We talked about lab versus field and performance versus uh, functional testing, active and passive testing, and why we need to have both in many cases for Volte testing. And lastly, I stressed the importance of the consistency of quality. Do again to its highly variable and somewhat unreliable physical nature, a uh, physical layer, and the wide variability in devices, Volte networks are likely to experience far greater variability in voice quality than other speech transmission networks. And therefore, we have to be careful not to look at just average values, but the variation in those values as well. Uh, with that, we've come to the end of the lecture portion of the webinar, and I'm not sure if we have time or not, but this is where we would have a short question and answer period. Yeah, Paul, I think we have time for just two questions, if that's okay with you. Uh, the first one being, what is the use of TCP and SIP? Ah, it's a good question. TCP, above IP, there are two different transport layer protocols. There's TCP, the transmission control protocol, and UDP, the user datagram protocol. Uh, UDP is unreliable. It basically just sends the packets. They get there, they get there, they don't, they don't. Uh, TCP uses a number of mechanisms. It actually has the ability to retransmit. It has sliding window sizes, et cetera. TCP's main value add for SIP signaling is that it provides reliable transport of the SIP messages. So if the SIP message is sent via UDP, it may or may not get there and you wouldn't know if it did and if it didn't get there there'd be no retransmission over tcp the message is essentially guaranteed to get there the downside is of course that tcp provides uh, or rather costs a certain amount of overhead and normally in sip signaling what we've seen is kind of a mix between tcp and udp there are mechanisms such as the prac i mentioned before that can be used over udp to sort of give a semi-reliable mechanism for delivering sip messages Great, and I think we have time for just one more question. What is the key point that makes Volte quality better than that in 2G or 3G? Ah, the, the, the key point. Uh, I would say that there are really, if, if I could, two key points. The first one is to make sure that you have a solid underlying RF layer. Uh, the kind of testing that we've done throughout cellular history what are my signal levels looking like in my field? What kind of interference issues do I have? What kind of throughput, what kind of bit rates, et cetera, or bit error rates are very, very important. Without a reliable physical RF layer, Volte is simply not gonna work. The other one is to make sure that you're really getting the most out of your Volte network. If your phones or your implementations don't support HD voice, customers may not see a substantial improvement over Volte. And I really can't understate the importance of HD voice in Volte networks as a means of providing even better quality voice and giving people motivation to move over to LTE and to Volte services. Great. Well, that's about all the time we have. I want to thank everyone for attending a practical introduction to Volte testing in the field presented by Rodi and Schwartz. And also, thank you to Paul Denisowski, application engineer at Rodi and Schwartz. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. And thanks, everyone, for attending.